If you've been thinking about becoming a member, now is the time. For the rest of the month, receive $10 off an annual membership. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, members-only bonus content, an invitation to join the DSR Network Slack community, a members-only newsletter, and members-only blog posts. To take advantage of this offer, visit thedsrnetwork.com slash buy, select the annual option, and enter code December 2022 at checkout. That's thedsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code December 2022 at checkout. Happy holidays. Nine. Twelve. Ten. Twenty-eight. Two. Twenty-three. This is Deep State Radio, coming to you direct from our super-secret studio in the third sub-basement of the Ministry of SNARK in Washington, D.C., and from other undisclosed locations across America and around the world. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. It's almost Christmas time here in Washington, D.C., And as a special Christmas treat to you guys, or as a holiday treat, depending on how you view these holidays, we have with us two great guests, David Korn from Mother Jones and from social media and from commenting on world affairs and domestic affairs pretty much uh, everywhere in the media. And we also have with us, coming from Florida, Norm Ornstein, our uh, friend who is uh, also with the American Enterprise Institute. And uh, Norm, you say it's getting cold in Florida? It is. Who knew there was such a thing as climate change? But there are wild swings in temperatures down here. Unfortunately, not such wild swings in politics. I blame Ron DeSantis. Uh, So last night I was, uh, after 30 years in Washington, I've, I've managed to avoid it for 30 years. But Last night, I went to White House Christmas party, and I suppose you should go once. And uh, I have to tell you, there was a sense of exuberance. The president was exuberant. The guests were exuberant. There was a real sense that this has been a very successful year for the Biden administration, and that the, the future looks pretty positive. And so I want to start there. David, do you think they're deluding themselves, or do you think that's justified? I am pretty much a half-empty type of guy. I understand where they're coming from. Uh, They were not crushed in the midterm elections. They have managed to achieve some legislative accomplishments. I hope they're not too Pollyannish about the threat and the challenges that still face us as a country. It's easy to look at the Republicans who barely crossed the finish line and gained control of the House as being in a dominant or strong position. But controlling one half of the legislative body of the United States is a big effing deal. No matter who ends up being speaker, no matter how ugly it looks, no matter how crazy they are, There's still a lot of damage they can do in terms of the budget, the debt ceiling, but just in terms of the political culture, in terms of promoting and advancing and bolstering Trumpism, even if Trumpism seems to be on the wane, and advancing various types of conspiracy theories and the politics of paranoia, grievance, and demagoguery. Basically, all the things that threaten democracy that Biden himself has talked about in a couple of high-profile speeches this year. We still need, as Norm just noted, need to some very dramatic action regarding climate change. The economy still is in a precarious position. It's not in a recession yet. It may be, end up there, maybe not. No one should be taking victory laps. No one should be saying, oh, we only need to work 40 hours a week. There are a lot of wins. Biden's done a lot better in the circumstances. But I still think we're not out of the overall hole that Trump has put us in over the last few years. Norm, I know how you consider these glass-half-full people. You consider them crazy optimists. 
So what's your day? Well, first, David, I want the record to reflect that you went to the White House Christmas party and not to the Hanukkah party. And uh, that's a Shonda, but that's another story for another day. I hope I will be forgiven. Okay. So first, let's emphasize that the first two years of Joe Biden's administration have been astonishingly productive. And I say astonishing because he faced enormous political headwinds. Having a tied Senate with two of its members hostile to most of his basic objectives, and having a margin in the House of three or four for most of the two years with different groups, each providing an opportunity to block whatever he wanted to do, and knowing that there would not be Republican votes for almost anything. So let's give him that credit. And with that, and given that yesterday was also a triumph with the visit of Vladimir Zelensky and wonderful pictures of the two of them together, and then Zelensky's remarkable speech, in which he gave ample praise to Biden, lots of reasons to be happy and maybe optimistic. But what David said, I think, needs to be underscored. I'm not sure they understand fully the impact of having an entirely radical, oppositional, indeed traitorous majority in the House of Representatives. And I'm still something, a theme that we've pursued before and will again. I'm scared to death that we face a default sometime in the middle of next year that they have not been able to act to take that debt ceiling hostage taking off the table. And while we came close to a default in 2011, and that caused the American bond rating to go down, credit rating, we have a much more radical group of people than that Tea Party group back then. And whoever the leader is, whether it is Kevin McCarthy, who would be the weakest leader in history and the worst, the worst speaker, or maybe Steve Scalise, who I always point out, once referred to himself as David Duke without the baggage, but he's accumulated a lot of baggage since he said that. We've got a real problem there. Now, they have reason to be happy that uh, we are on the verge of getting a $1.7 trillion omnibus appropriation that at least will take us through to the end of the fiscal year, which will be October 1st of next year. But then we're going to see all kinds of stoppages. And of course, that omnibus didn't give them everything that they wanted or that we needed, including the child tax credit. But that's okay at the moment. You just have to worry about what damage, not just the outrageous pseudo investigations that they're going to do, but their ability to use the power of the purse and the debt ceiling to drive the country into a hole. So have a nice uh, holiday. <laughs> I knew I could. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> and uh, for people who need a dose of that, pick me up each week. Don't forget, Norm co-hosts our Words Matter podcast. David, I uh, will change the subject slightly, uh, although it touches up tangentially in all of this. We've had this week the release of the January sixth committee's full report. I have been following with interest your uh, social media takes on this, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you have gleaned from the release of the full report that may be new. As we talk, we're still waiting for the release of the ultimate full report. They put out a 161-page introduction. That was just the introduction. The executive summary needed an executive summary a couple of days ago. And then they also started putting out some of the depositions from, from the witnesses. And so I and other yeah, I guess reporters, that's what I was looking at, was you yeah, were reading through some of those depositions. Yeah, so we've started reading through a lot of this material. And I just finished, before we started here, my um, newsletter of Our Land, which, in which I was talking about what we see initially from this and from the Trump tax returns. You know, in some ways, the January 6th committee was given the task of proving what was already proven, that Donald Trump basically tried to destroy American democracy. You know, we saw this in real time. We saw it with our own eyes. We saw him declare that, the that he'd won the election when he hadn't. 
uh, we saw him incite people to, a, you know, riot at the Capitol. A lot of things that have hap- happened in between in terms of him pressuring state officials. We saw some of that in real time or near real time, telling Georgian officials, just find me 11,000 votes. We didn't know so much about how he tried to use the Justice Department to declare the election corrupt and fraudulent, but we know a lot of that now. What the committee has done in its hearings and in this initial report, and I assume in the final report, is to give us reams and reams of details that underline the multiple conspiracies that Donald Trump waged to prevent the transfer of power, the peaceful transfer of power, and to retain power more or less illegally. A question, you know, people ask, is this going to make a difference? I think the hearings themselves have have reinforced that narrative for Americans who are not part of the Trump cult. You're never going to reach the Trump cult. They're going to keep saying that Antifa attacked the Capitol, that the election was stolen, all the craziness. And that's going to remain very, you know, very much a part of the views of 20 to 30 percent of Americans. And you can't do anything about this. But I think the committee, by documenting to such extensive specifics what happened in all the ways, the many ways that Trump tried to subvert the Constitution, have, you know, has produced a damning, a devastating indictment of Trump, whether he's actually indicted or not. And that's important for history. And it's important for the rest of us to have that narrative bolstered, reinforced, so that going ahead, we understand fully and clearly what Trump tried to do and what he almost pulled off. Norm, what's your take on what we've learned this week? Well, in the spirit of the depositions, I'll take the fifth, or as they said many times, fifth, just to shorten it. And of course, the depositions themselves are particularly damning. We have to remember that while all of us give the presumption of innocence and say that taking the Fifth Amendment does not mean necessarily guilt, let's note that all of these people extraordinarily close to Donald Trump, that Donald Trump himself has said many times, hey, if you take the Fifth Amendment, you're guilty. So Charlie Kirk, Jeffrey Clark, every one of these witnesses including questions like, what's your name? Where do you live? Would say, fifth, I'll take the fifth. The level of odiousness by all of these people around Trump, the enablers, just as hard to even describe. Having said that, David is right. And then let's add that there will be criminal referrals of some of these others. And I think that's also important. I believe that the weight of the evidence and the criminal referrals put pressure on the Justice Department to move forward. They are going to have to explain why there are no indictments, given what is the weight, enormous weight of evidence. Now, I'll make one other comment, and I was just reading this morning another compelling column from the great Dahlia Lithwick, which was disappointment that there appears to be not a single mention of Clarence Thomas or Ginny Thomas. Ginny Thomas was up to her eyeballs in inciting the insurrection, in helping with the insurrection, and Clarence Thomas has refused to stay out of any of the cases in which his wife was material. So that's a disappointment. Not surprising, perhaps, and I have no idea inside the committee and the dynamics of whether it was the Republicans on the committee who said stay away from Clarence Thomas, whether it was they didn't want to go off on a sidetrack, which involved the ethics of the Supreme Court. But of all the people engaged in inciting this violent insurrection, Ginny Thomas stands out. And so it's incomplete here. But watching that last hearing, the video that they put together, reminding people, you know, stuff goes past, you forget a lot of the details of how awful this was and how clearly it was planned on that front and with what we've seen even from the intro, the committee deserves an A or an A+. No doubt the committee does. But David, the committee's been doing a lot of work that I was hoping the Department of Justice was doing. We're almost on the two-year anniversary of January 6th. We passed in September the amount of time that elapsed between 
Watergate and when the the biggest figures indicted in Watergate were actually indicted. And while we do have a special prosecutor, and I'm going to set aside all this Mar-a-Lago stuff for a moment, although you know it's another instance where things happened and the response of the government to obvious crimes has been remarkably slow. What the the this January 6th committee that does deserve the A plus that Norm gave it has done is for show. It's had a political consequence, but no legal consequence. And indeed, some of what they tried to do legally with regard to people not cooperating with their committee was rebuffed from by the Justice Department. And there are plenty of people who say, oh no, but that's because they're working on on deals and we don't know about it. As one observer, I, I have to say I'm frustrated. Do you think 2023 will be the year in which that frustration that people are not being held to account for the worst such crime by an American president is, you know, do you think that's going to happen? I can't predict whether it will or it won't. A few months ago, people thought the Justice Department was doing nothing on this front, right? And then there were a bunch of raids and subpoenas. And now there's an appointment of a special counsel, Jack Smith, who by all accounts looks like a pretty hard-ass independent prosecutor. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm loath to, to sort of throw up my hands and say, yeah, yeah nothing's ever going to happen. I think the committee has, you know, whether the Justice Department was moving at all-out speed or not, I think the committee certainly lit a fire or gave them, you know, gave them material to move quicker. And, and I think they have. I, mean, I think they've also done a very good case, as has Jamie Raskin in particular, of laying out some of the potential crimes, particularly those committed by Donald Trump. I do recognize that for the Justice Department, indicting a former president who's running again is a hard decision. The last thing you want to do with Donald Trump is bring a case against him and lose. Imagine what that would mean. You know, it would, it would, it would make it look like it was politicized and, and weaponized and not a legitimate case. So I really think, and I, I'm not sure this is a bad thing, that if you're going to go after a political candidate, former president, there has to be a pretty high bar. You know, prosecutors decide all the time if they have a strong enough case that will play in front of 12 jurors and you won't get one person who says, I don't buy this, I'm not going along. They have to make that decision all the time. So I think it is a, it is a difficult decision to make in this particular case. I think it would be tragic if they end up indicting people like John Eastman and others and let Trump go scot-free, since he was indeed the ringleader and the chief co-conspirator. This is very unlike me, David, withholding judgment <laughs> on, on what's happening at the Justice Department. They do seem to be active. Even Alvin Bragg, the New York City district attorney, seems to be re reinvigorating his case up there that he seemed to put to the side. Mar Largo seems to be a strong case as well. It's not like me to hope, but I am hoping that at the end of the day, there will be some accountability some measure of justice here. But, you know, I know I'm droning on, but one final point is that whatever happens criminally, I think it's also important that as a political society, that we, really, that we reach some degree of consensus that what happened was wrong. And we're not going to get there. The power of shame is almost as important as the power of imprisonment. And what we've lost in the last few years here is the ability to have a conversation in which we more or less decide that what happened was wrong on January 6th and overthrowing the election and all that. And it's turned into this tribal partisan battle uh, that doesn't seem to be waning. And I worry that the House Republicans coming in are going to try to find a way to keep up their end of the fight here in terms of protecting those who try to overthrow the Constitution. Do you think by the end of next year, we will be closer to a consensus that trying to overthrow the government of the United States is bad, or are we going to be stuck right where we are? Well, it depends on what you mean by consensus, I suppose. 
And it was interesting that when Michael Flynn uh, was asked, do you think that overthrowing the uh, attempted violent overthrow of the federal government is bad? He took the fifth. So consensus is not going to mean 80 or 90 percent. David is right. The uh, never not Trumpers will still probably make up 30 percent of the electorate. But I think we will be a lot closer to understanding how close we came to losing it all. I, I want to, uh, you know, just weighing in, I agree with everything that David said. I've taken some flack. For um, on Twitter, people saying, you know, you call for uh, cr- criminalizing all kinds of bad behavior, but you never criticize your friend Merrick Garland. And uh, I have not criticized Merrick Garland because I think, as David said, if you're going to go after a former president, you want to be sure you have everything in place. And let's note that nobody criticizes Fannie Willis. Everybody views Fannie Willis in Georgia as a hard-charging, tough-minded prosecutor. Well, the evidence that she is dealing with, clear-cut violation of Georgia law taking place just after the 2020 election, she hasn't brought an indictment against Trump yet. She is taking this slowly and building that case because, as David said, you've got to win with a jury of 12. Now, the dilemma for the Justice Department, as I see it now, is the strongest case, the absolute slam dunk right off the bat is the Mar-a-Lago case. He had illegal possession of documents that belong to the National Archives, the federal government, the American people, and many of them highly sensitive top secret ones on top of it. The problem there is a venue one. You might have to try that case in Florida. And finding a jury, no matter how strong the evidence, that doesn't include at least one Trumpist who will say, yeah, I saw him shoot the person in broad daylight on Fifth Avenue. So what? He's a god. That's the one you would want to bring first, but they may hesitate. Where you can bring a case in the District of Columbia is with the January 6th insurrection, but proving intent is still a little tricky. So I think what the January 6th committee did is to move us much closer to having the absolute evidence of intent. And I do expect we're going to move forward with indictments. Let us also note that with the release of these tax returns and with finally a new and presumably non-corrupt commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, we may well see the federal government and the IRS try to claw back what might be a billion dollars worth of illegal deductions and uh, credits that Donald Trump took. As David said, Alvin Bragg is moving forward, but also he's in serious danger of losing both a lot of money and properties with the case that Tish James is bringing in New York. He is in a world of trouble, and some of these things are going to stick to him. Whether he spends a day in jail, I do not know, but I know that this is not going to end well for Donald Trump, and that is a good thing for the American people. And I do believe that 70% of Americans at some point are going to believe that this guy did really bad things. He's done all that, and there was a morning consult poll yesterday that said Trump leads the Republican field, and not by a little. You know, it was something like 47% for Trump to 35% or something like that for DeSantis. It's not like he's shuffled off the stage just yet. Well, I got to tell you, I appreciate your perspectives. Uh, We're uh, not all going to get to talk again, uh, at least on this forum, until 2023. 2023 is the last year in which this process can produce some accountability because 2024 is an election year. And it is going to be very tough to achieve that. Having said that, we are at the conclusion of this segment of the program. I want to thank you, Norm. I want to thank you, David. I want to thank everybody in the public for listening in. This is where we will sign off for now. We'll be back after the break with Representative Adam Smith in a conversation about yesterday's events with uh, President Zelensky in Washington. And uh, I look forward to that. So stand by.